Well, she was always like pushing me away. I, I wasn't her type. She told me like, well, she's a completely new type of person in relationship. Yeah. In the back of my head, I was just telling myself, what are you doing? It just didn't seem right. It was like a roller coaster ride that I just kept punching the ticket on. I'm like, I don't even want to see you every day. I've never ever worked a case like this where someone would have ever. In his prison interview, Chris Watts, the man who committed one of the most heinous crimes in recent history, talks about his wife, Shanann, and his extramarital relationship with Nicole Kessinger. What makes Chris dangerous? What do his statements reveal about his personality? And how? What are the inconsistencies and which linguistic tactics does he use? This case teaches us how to identify the language of deceptive people. Which linguistic warning signs we need to watch out for? Welcome to the channel. The first thing that should be noted is how one of the agents, Coda, addresses Chris. Coda praises Chris and makes him sound special. This is the optimal way of getting someone as self-centered as Chris to talk. Let's listen. For me personally, I don't know if you remember, but one of the last things you told me was, Hey Graham, I'm sorry that I started lying to you. Um, and that stuck with me for the last couple of months. It's been ringing in my head, right? Um, I've never ever worked a case like this where someone told me that ever. Um, you know, and so as I walked away, I thought, Chris is different. Chris is a little bit unique in that regard. Um, Coda establishes a relationship between him and Chris, a conversational discourse involving a you and an I. I don't know if you remember. Indicates that Chris has made an impact on him. It's been ringing in my head, right? And with his intonation. I've never ever. And word choice. Unique. He underlines that Chris is special, allegedly. Whether he downplays the uniqueness. A little bit in that regard. Because his tactic would otherwise have been too obvious. Is anyone's guess. The important thing is that Coda's preface establishes trust and gets Chris to think that there's something about him that's interesting. Also, by mentioning this example, One of the last things you told me was, Hey Graham, I'm sorry that I started lying to you. Coda implies that Chris has been honest with him before, so by inference, Chris can be honest with him again, namely in this interview. Coda cleverly minimizes the interest that they as agents have in getting Chris to talk about his crime. As if Chris's well-being is that top priority. I hope that when we're done, you'll feel better. I hope it'll be therapeutic. Um, we're going to talk about, obviously, um, what happened to your family. So that's going to be hard to talk about. I appreciate anything you can tell me about it. Um, if you need to take time out, if you need to get a tissue, that's fine. Right? Um, I think it'll be very good for you. It'll be good for us. In the following, Chris is asked to tell about his relationship with Nicole. Tell us about the time to spent with her. Well, I mean, it felt like it was, you know, I think, like when you say, like, more, more like a shy guy, it's kind of like I've never, like, been pursued by anybody before. It's kind of like I was the one, you know, trying to pursue. When people speak, they give clues about their identity, how they perceive themselves, and what they value. Here, the first thing on Chris's mind, apparently, what he values, is the affirmation he gets from being pursued and being flattered. In that regard, Chris can use the shy guy narrative to make it look like things in life happen to him, that he's not the one instigating. More, more like a shy guy. I would have never in a million years thought something like this could happen to him. Bella was just like Chris. Just, just like him, shy, cautious, conservative. I was the quiet kid. I was the, you know, I just kind of my sister was the rebellious one that always, you know, like, I'm a good one. This role functions as a mask, because in Chris's case, there's a lot that indicates that being shy isn't his primary defining characteristic, but that lack of remorse and emotions in general are traits that aren't typically associated with shy people, but with psychopathic people. Chris could have potentially used this mask, parroted this narrative, to deceive people throughout his life taking advantage of people's trust. I mean, I've always been had a really crazy imagination. So I, like when I was a kid, like I even convinced my teacher I was going to, I went to Japan a little summer or to China or something. Why did you convince your teacher you had gone to another country? It was just like what you did over the summer. And I was like, oh, I went to China. It's all right. <laughs> she actually believed it. I, I was really convincing. Chris was asked to tell about the time he spent with Nicole, 
but he immediately starts talking about his wife, his victim. Let's listen. Like when me and Shanann met, it was like, you know, she was always like pushing me away, kind of like, you know, I guess I was one of her type. And you weren't her type? I, I wasn't her type, because right. like, she, she, she told me like, when, right. I, when, I, when she first, because we had met, she told you that. <laughs> yeah. You're not. I remember you telling me that. <laughs> yeah, it was like. Chris makes his relationship with Nicole sound positive by hinting at negative aspects of his relationship with his wife. This is the first of several instances where Chris portrays his victim in a negative or slightly negative light. I'll get back to why that's important. In the following, notice how it doesn't sound like Chris is describing an experience with his victim, someone whose life he took. This is telling. You know, when we first met, like, was at a movie theater. And I should know the doorman, you know, was in a suit. And I was just like, <laughs> this isn't good. Yeah. I think he came. I think he came like he was going to a like a Cinemax. Like, like, yeah, it's when she first saw me, she was like, "I should probably just turn and talk, talk to the bartender a little more." <laughs> no, I'm not like I'm not, I'm not here to meet. Here, the agents aligning laughter and encouraging responses help underline that Chris's knowledge about what he's done doesn't stop him from narrating in a carefree tone of voice. He even impersonates his victim. Chris is reminiscing as if he hadn't committed a crime. In the following, Chris continues with yet another narrative, and a point to remember about narratives is that the narrator is like a director, guiding the audience what to think about the characters in it. Thus, it's important to pay attention to who's depicted as the hero or helper, and who's depicted as the obstacle or enemy, because these depictions are always closely tied to the narrative's theme, in this case to portray Chris as the self-sacrificing husband. Once again, Chris's carefree tone of voice should be noted. Yeah, it was, I was always pursuing her, and then just like, um, finally I just, I threw on to her, like, you know, I'm always like, like with her medication and stuff, I would always like, she had like eight miles of medication, so I would always get like her day and nights and kind of like put them all in that little, you know, flip open the box, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I would always, you know, be around her. I even went to her colonoscopy. And she said after that, she knew that I was like a, kind of a keeper. It's like, you know, like, who goes to a colonoscopy after three months with somebody? Man. That's a little soon. <laughs> <laughs> but she asked if she needed a ride. I'm like, yeah. She's like, you want to go across my colonoscopy with me? I'm like, sure, why not? Yeah. Like, even sat with her while she drank that nasty stuff all day. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> or she's in the bathroom that's all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that clear stuff that's not real, that doesn't really taste clear. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, Twice, Chris uses the adverb even, which refers to something unexpected or extreme even. I even went to her colonoscopy. Like, even sat with her while she... Chris doesn't leave the interpretation up to people. Instead, he guides people what to think of him. His rhetorical question is interesting in that regard. Who goes to a colonoscopy after three months with somebody? Chris implies that no one would do what he did for his wife, and saying it in form of a question makes it sound less direct less self-aggrandizing, even though it is self-aggrandizing. The words he associates with his wife are relevant to note, not to mention his inappropriate laughter. Like she had like eight miles of medication, so like even sat with her while she drank that nasty stuff all day. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah that's... <laughs> this, coupled with mentioning the colonoscopy, suggests an element of disgust, an element of downgrading his victim while lifting himself up. Deceptive people like Chris will often emphasize or exaggerate what they did for their victims by highlighting perceived negative aspects of their victim's personality or life. This can be a way to internally and or outwardly justify their wrongdoing. And later in this interview, Chris downplays his horrific decisions. Let's listen. There was one church service, uh, the only one I've family gone to in here, and uh, so do not define by one moment in your life. And I think that's like people are defining me by one point, one moment in my life. They don't know like what happened before, what can happen later. Right. Well, I just hope that you know, maybe hopefully one day people can stop stop judging everybody. This is extreme downplaying of his decisions and what his victims had to endure. Chris says this as if other people should be able to relate to doing something evil, when the truth is this wasn't just one moment. Implicitly, Chris judges other people for defining him by one moment. By inference, then, Chris actually says that it's people, us, who need to learn this lesson. 
as if he's in a position to remind or even reprimand people. This indicates a lack of guilt and a prominent sense of self-importance and entitlement. Positive self-descriptions and more or less negative descriptions about the victims portray the speaker in a positive light and have a self-serving function. So then with Nikki, was it different? It just seemed like I was more in control, it seemed like, and that never happened. Like she'd actually like asked me like, like my opinion on a lot of things, just like what I wanted to do and just kind of like, okay. That was new, wasn't it? Very new. The adverb actually is dependent, meaning it requires an attendant thought to make sense. The opposite thought, like when someone says, the meeting actually went well. They're comparing the meeting going well to their expectation that the meeting wouldn't go well. So when Chris says that Nicole actually asked him about his opinion, it's implied that his wife didn't, supposedly. Thus, Chris keeps emphasizing his victim-like role in the marriage, portraying his wife as somebody who restricted him and didn't listen to him. In the following, Chris underlines what he valued about his relationship with Nicole. She wanted to go to the car museum, Shelby Museum in Boulder. I've never been there. And I was, That's right up your alley. It's not yeah, mechanic. I was just like, that was awesome just to walk around cars for like an hour or so. And then, you know, drag race in Vandermeer. Okay. Not, I haven't been to a drag race since 2008. That was Charlotte. Okay. Like that was the drag strip over there. This like the NHRA, the top fuel mm -hmm. fuck car stuff, like me and my dad used to grow up. Yeah. Go there like all the time. And then, like, uh, went to camping in uh, Sand Dunes National Park. Mm -hmm. And I had never, I'd, I'd never been camping, I always wanted to do it. But she's a completely new type of uh, person and relationship. Yeah. Chris didn't so much fall in love with Nicole as he fell in love with an extension of himself, doing all the things he wanted to do with the words. I haven't been to a drag race since. 2008, and I always wanted to do it. Chris implies what his marriage, and thus his victim, kept him from doing, supposedly. Once more, he devalues his victim. Chris seems oblivious to the potential motives of the other person, because when you find someone who's willing to do all the things you want to do, it's typically in the beginning of a relationship, as a means to win you over. It's not indicative of how the relationship is going to be. Chris continues to make statements that reveal his personality. What were you thinking this whole time? Like, I did, I, in the back of my head, I was telling myself, what are you doing? Like, you know, every time, you know, I, I open up my phone, I can see pictures, like, of my wife and my kids. I'm just like, what am I doing? And then, like, every time I was with her, it seemed like I didn't think. It seemed like it was like a, like a blinder that was on my face. Oh. And it was... Like every time I look back on it, like, you know. Like a blinder that was in my face, Chris says, making the blinder the grammatical subject as opposed to him and his conscious decisions. And he prefaces this phrase with, And then like every time I was with her, it seemed like, Almost as if it was Nicole's presence that caused this, and not his own personality structure. With his upspeak, Like a blinder that was in my face? Chris doesn't sound certain of this. Since this interview, it's been reported that Chris has referred to Nicole as a Jezebel, someone who deceives people to get what she wants. Chris is prepared to say and do almost anything to avoid holding himself accountable. Chris could see the pictures of his family, but these pictures didn't stop him from continuing his relationship with Nicole. So what's the point of bringing it up? From Chris's perspective, there could be a point in bringing it up to accommodate Coda's question, to give the response he knows he should give, according to societal norms, as if he's criticizing himself, even though it's not much of a criticism. What are you doing? What am I doing? Chris's lack of deep-rooted emotions is evident. You know, my attorneys told me, like, you need to show a little more emotion, because I guess the first time I went to the courtroom, I didn't know, I didn't know what to expect. I'm still, like... I said I was just a cold person, just looking at it. According to Nicole, she was the one who had to decide to take things slow. In the following, Nicole underlines a supposed distance, rather than a connection. I really try to take everything with this whole situation very slow. The only part that I screwed up on was the fact that he wasn't completely separated from her when him and I decided to spend time with each other. That is where I screwed up. 
But other than that, everything else, it was always like, you know, you build your life, I'm going to build my life, we will intertwine them, but I am not ready to, like, do this. And I'm like, I don't even want to see you every day. Like Chris, Nicole distances herself from Chris's victim and portrays herself in a favorable light. This is made more than clear when Nicole brings up Chris and Chinan's less than great financial situation. And I knew that those two had been through some financial trouble. I definitely found out a lot more about that situation in the newspaper recently. Um, when I went to that house, everything in there is very, 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 very nice. It looks like it all comes with a very expensive price tag. And uh, I didn't say anything to him about it, but I could kind of tell then where I was like just looking at everything like, how do you guys afford this? And then he has that car. They're living above their means or below oh, their oh means? Oh my God, like... Whew. Way too much. Way, 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 Did way he ever discuss? He told me, he's like, you know, I feel like my paycheck goes in my bank account and I just watch it go like this. He's like, but it doesn't have to. He's like, she makes it like that. Well, I just like, I wanted to sell the house just to, like, so we can get, like, if we do separate, like, we'd have, like, some money to ourselves. She had told me before, like, you know, if we did separate, like, she couldn't afford to live her on her own. And she said, neither could I. So you weren't talking about you guys buying a house together somewhere. It was more like, I mean, let's sell, sell it, it split it, and sell it, and just, like, we can, we can go. Next, Chris continues to talk about the blinder. Like, I have, like, this book. Uh, I used to read for CC, and I had I remember that book, so I read that to, to them like every night. And like there's some scripture and stuff that I read to them, so I just try to, you know, just try to think back. Like I wish this never happened. It was just like I wish that blinder went on my head, went in my eyes, that would have seen what was going on. Like, you know, I was having, get, everybody said, oh, you're just out, out there having fun while your kids, you know, or kids and wife are on vacation. I was like, no, I'm just. It wasn't like that, but it seemed like that's what it looked like when you know, we were going, you know, we were going to camping, going to drag race, going all the other stuff that you have fun doing but you're with somebody else. It's not good family. It just didn't seem right. It just didn't seem right, Chris claims, as he sounds like someone who's on the verge of crying. However, what's important is that he chose to do it anyway. Once again, Chris knows what to say according to societal norms in order to make it sound like he's holding himself accountable, but his actions point to a much different, unemotional and self-centered mindset. Shelby Museum and Boulder, that was awesome. Just the parent, I said, oh, you're just out, out there having fun while your kids, you know, or kids and wife are on vacation. I'm just like, no, I'm just, I'm just like, I wish that blinder went on my head, went in my eyes, that would have seen what was going on. Like, you know, I was having... This is distancing language with a self-protective and self-serving function. Chris emphasizes the blinder almost as if it's a separate entity, not him and his conscious decisions. He says, What was going on? Like, you know, how was that? Not what I had done or something similar that would show agency. The final excerpt speaks volumes about Chris's mindset. I know it's hard to, I know it's wrong to say, I wish I'd never met somebody, but I wish I'd, you know, maybe met her at work and then just kept it that way. You tell me if I'm wrong. You're not the type of guy to take control sometimes when you need to. Yeah, it seems like that's just what happened. Yeah, I didn't I didn't take control of the situation. I'm just like the situation control of me. Right, it just happened. No, I get that, man. I'm I'm somewhat passive myself, but it's like, you know, there's situations where I'm like, well, why did I let that keep going? No. Yeah, I don't know why it was like it was like a roller coaster ride that I just kept punching the ticket on and just never get up. Yeah. This speaks to one of my first points, that Chris consistently uses language, excuses, that allows him to play the role of the victim, as the self-sacrificing, passive, shy guy. Things in life happen to him as if he doesn't have a say in the matter, referring to what he's done as a roller coaster ride, and that the situation controls him, is oversimplifying and ultimately self-serving. Language that shows just how unwilling Chris is to hold himself accountable. He knows when and how to say the right things. Everybody said, oh, you're just out, out there having fun while your kids, you know, or kids and wife are on vacation. I'm just like, no. I'm just... But his own statements give him away. Shelby Museum and Boulder. That was awesome. Just 
as soon as Coda offers him an easy solution. Yeah, it seems like that's just what happened. Right, it just happened. He runs with it. Chris's speech behavior reveals a person who doesn't experience emotions the same way most people do. A person who doesn't have a proper concept of guilt and remorse. If you liked the video, be sure to click the like button and subscribe for more videos. Until next time.